We're very lucky today to have Dr. Emma Kaplan-Lewis with us for her grand rounds on cardiovascular disease and HIV. Dr. Kaplan-Lewis received her medical degree from NYU School of Medicine. She then went on to complete her internal medicine residency training at MGH and then came here for her infectious disease training. Dr. Kaplan-Lewis's research interests include cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk prevention in HIV patients. It is in this area that she's published multiple uh, publications. She currently serves an as an assistant professor of medicine here at Sinai. Dr. Kaplan-Lewis provides HIV primary care and imparts endless knowledge to our residents as one of our most beloved inpatient HIV attendings. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Kaplan-Lewis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that very lovely, generous welcome. Um, I'm Emma Kaplan-Lewis. I'm going to talk today about HIV and cardiovascular disease. These are my disclosures. So I'll go through some cases, I talk a little bit about the epidemiology and the multifactorial etiology of cardiovascular disease and HIV, go through um, how to do as well as the limitations of risk assessment tools as well as some of the treatment options. To start with the case, so a 65-year-old gentleman with HIV, CD4-376, viral load undetectable, diagnosed 30 years ago in 1988, nadir CD4 pretty low at 20, um, prior opportunistic infections before immune reconstitution of CMV retinitis and disseminated MAC, on antiretroviral therapy for 20 years, including a protease inhibitor-based regimen until recently, uh, stavidine, which is abbreviated D4T, an older nucleoside was in his first regimen. Currently, he's on fixed-dose combination of abacavir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. Comorbidities including active smoking, CKD, hypertension, prior crack cocaine use. So he comes in with chest pain, dyspnea, and is diagnosed with an NSTEMI. So how much is HIV contributing to this gentleman's coronary risk? So age and gender certainly, active smoking and hypertension. If he had relapse of his crack cocaine use, he could be at risk for a type 2 myocardial infarction, so not plaque rupture induced, but more vasospasm. Um, low nadir CD4 sort of indicates how long somebody has had viral replication prior to treatment and generally is correlated with more immune dysregulation. Uh, he had about a decade without antiretroviral therapy, so similarly um, untreated viral replication. The fact that he had CMV, somewhat controversial, but this is also an immunomodulatory pro-inflammatory virus, the protease inhibitor exposure, and maybe his current ART regimen, which includes a back of air. So I'll get into some of these variables and talk about the how much they contribute or don't to his coronary risk. Now in contrast to that case, take this person. 45-year-old gentleman with HIV, CD4-676, undetectable viral load, diagnosed three months ago, immediately started on treatment. His nadir CD4 is above 500 on the same regimen, also has other cardiac risk factors, active smoking, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, obesity. So how much is HIV contributing to this person's coronary risk? So the main differences between these two cases are when they were diagnosed, um, when they were started on treatment, what medications they were exposed to, the newer versus the older HIV regimen. Um, and this person is really sort of representative, the second case, of the more modern HIV epidemic. We have very good evidence from large randomized controlled trials. We start people on treatment right away. People are diagnosed earlier on after acquisition of HIV. Start people, like I said, immediately on medication with better medication, less toxic, less side effects. So there's really kind of two cohorts of people with HIV who are at risk for, car uh, for cardiovascular disease, and it's important to know sort of where your patient falls. Uh, in between those two. So the life expectancy for people with HIV is approaching that of the general population. Uh, this study shows for all comers that there's a 13-year age gap. If somebody with HIV starts antiretroviral therapy at 20 years old um, when their CD4 is above 500, 
Now that life expectancy gap goes down to about six to seven years if the person has no comorbidities, no substance use, is a non-smoker, no hepatitis co-infection. This is importantly based on modeling in this Kaiser Permanente cohort. Um, there's other studies with different modeling that actually show that the life expectancy gap between people with HIV and those without is as little as less than a year or a couple months. So people are generally can expect if you start treatment right away with a good CD4 to live a normal lifespan and that's how we counsel our patients. With increased life expectancy, there comes, however, complications related to aging. So this case control study looks at patients with HIV, the cases on the left and the controls on the right, um, and looks at their non-infection related comorbidities, so cardiovascular disease, bone disease, malignancy, hypertension. Um, and you can see that there's a much higher prevalence and also at younger ages of these comorbidities in people with HIV. If you look at the 41 to 50 year age uh, group in people with HIV, it sort of looks similar to the 10 year older group in the controls. So more comorbidities and potentially appearing um, at younger ages. Now, um, yeah. So the New York City Department of Health uh, looked at mortality trends and cardiovascular disease mortality trends in people with HIV in New York City compared to people without HIV and showed that overall um, mortality related to HIV was decreasing um, and as such proportion of mortality due to cardiovascular disease was actually increasing. That being said, the mortality rate from cardiovascular disease was declining, just basically showing that people are with HIV are living longer, are dying less as a complication from complications related to immune deficiency, and as such are gonna have a larger contribution to mortality be from um, cardiovascular disease. So how much is the excess risk in people with HIV? So there's numerous cohort studies that look at this, rates of incident MI in people with HIV compared to those without, controlling for traditional risk factors. Um, and generally the risk has been shown to be 1.5 to two times that of the general population. Um, in 2013, the VAX cohort, which looks at veterans with HIV compared to those without, showed a hazard ratio of MI of 1.48 in people with HIV compared to those without and they adjusted for Framingham risk score, comorbidities, substance use, so pretty comprehensive adjustment for traditional cardiac risk factors and still found um, that there was elevated risk of MI. The landscape is changing, however. So if you look at all comers at the top level and then the, um, for all years, and then the different, the different year breakdown, the most recent data from 2010 to 2011 actually shows no difference in rates of incident MI between people with HIV and those without. So the earlier years of the epidemic, um, people exposed to older medications, potentially yes, there is a higher risk of MI, but more recently, maybe not so much as we initially thought. So what's the reason for this? So combination of better drugs, better HIV drugs, this is looking at prescribing patterns um, for, of providers prescribing antiretroviral therapy. And you could see, thank goodness, that there is a decrease in D4T, which is stavidine, a very old, fairly toxic nucleoside, and an increase in newer, um, not newer anymore, but less cardiotoxic or more cardiac neutral medications like tenofovir and atazanavir. And then also with people living longer, there's more sort of comprehensive approach to primary care for people with HIV. It's not so much just a survival game of preventing opportunistic infections, but really <laughs> thoroughly managing comorbidities and preventing morbidity um, and mortality. And so people, especially those on antiretroviral therapy, indicating that they're engaged in care are more likely to also be prescribed lipid lowering medication. So this study is interesting. It looks at HIV RN data, um, which actually a large number of our Mount Sinai patients contribute to this cohort, and looks at different groups of people with HIV, elite control, 
means that their immune system for not totally understood reasons is able to control the virus with a normal CD4 and undetectable viral load even without medication. Um, high viremia, low viremia, and full medical control. And surprisingly, the highest rates of hospitalization were actually in the elite control group, which was not entirely expected. Um, the next highest was high viremia group, which would, would be expected. So looking at the reasons for hospitalization, the most common cause of hospitalization among the elite controllers was actually cardiovascular etiology or cardiovascular disease. Amongst all other groups, non-AIDS um, related or non-AIDS defining infections were most common. So not entirely understood what exactly is happening here, but one hypothesis is um, that some genetic polymorphism that allows the elite controller's immune system to really um, independently control HIV also pretends some degree of cardiovascular risk. So now I've talked a little bit about the epidemiology and to go into uh, some of the etiology of cardiovascular disease. So um, there's non-modifiable risk factors. I'm not going to really spend any time talking about that. Um, there's modifiable risk factors, so behavior, tobacco use, stimulant use, um, metabolic syndrome, so dyslipidemia, visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction. Some of that is from the virus itself, some from the older treatments used uh, for HIV, uh, chronic inflammation, a, a decreased intestinal gut barrier with increased microbial translocation. So all this sort of comes together in a melting pot of cardiovascular risk. So this is a busy slide, but I like it um, because it sort of goes into how complicated and whole, how multifactorial the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease is in people with HIV. So in the center, you see HIV and antiretroviral therapy, and it really is an interplay between the virus itself as well as the medication, especially when we're talking about the older medications. And it's hard to know kind of what is primary virus versus what is toxicity from the medicine. Um, again, the older medicine, not, not exactly what we use now. So that interplay then goes to affect um, immune activation with viral replication. That's obviously the virus directly. Vascular and endothelial dysfunction, which I'll talk more about. Chronic inflammation and then dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, um, as well as underlying traditional risk factors and genetics. So for dyslipidemia, untreated HIV has a very characteristic pattern that's been shown in numerous studies um, of high triglycerides and low HDL. Uh, HIV viremia actually correlates with the degree of high triglycerides, and it's thought to potentially be mediated by interferon alpha. There's other models of chronic infection or chronic inflammatory conditions that change your cytokine expression and also have different uh, lipid abnormalities. And as somebody who's untreated for HIV progresses to AIDS, there's a pattern of first decreased uh, cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, and then secondly, elevated triglycerides. The mechanism for the decreased cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, again, is not fully understood, but thought that HIV maybe inhibits cholesterol out of macrophages, leading to increased tissue-based um, lipid-laden macrophages. Antiretroviral therapy also has an effect on lipids. Older protease inhibitors, um, not the uh, darunavir persister or adazanavir that we use now, um, but older protease inhibitors increase LDL and triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Some of the NNRTIs, particularly efavirenz, increase all cholesterol, so LDL in total, as well as HDL, so potentially balance out the bad effect with the good. For insulin resistance, so unlike lipids, where really there is a very clear primary effect from HIV itself, insulin resistance is thought more to be medication effect, of particularly older medicine. So a cohort study looking at people with and without HIV, uh, the MAX cohort study, showed about three times the prevalence rate of diabetes in people with HIV compared to those without. Now this is a bit of an older study at this point. 75% of the patients were on protease inhibitor-based therapy. Um, if any of you have rotated on silver, you know that we really try and do integrase-based therapy, though that being said, we still do see patients frequently on protease inhibitors. Um, a limitation of the study was they didn't report on use of nucleosides. 
So mechanism of insulin resistance for some of the older antiretrovirals, um, which we are, like I said, still seeing. So protease inhibitors downregulate GLUT4, which is the major glucose transporter on um, cardiac and skeletal muscle, uh, so leading to hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. There's some data looking at nilfinavir, one of the older um, protease inhibitors, and insulin signaling, as well as adipocyte turnover and apoptosis. Uh, so really um, altering fat metabolism. You can see people who've been exposed to protease inhibitors for long periods of time. They'll have some uh, body changes or body habitus changes with facial wasting and then increased either visceral adiposity with a gut or a potential like buffalo hump on the back. Uh, for NRTIs, it's really cumulative exposure to older NRTIs like zaduvidine or stavidine. Uh, there was one study that showed for every year of exposure to these medications, there was an 8% increased risk of um, insulin resistance and potentially diabetes. And like I said, the mechanism is really increased visceral adiposity and altering fat metabolism. It's important to know if you see somebody who's maybe had HIV for a long time, regardless of their current regimen, if you see the physical changes to definitely have a high index of suspicion for underlying metabolic complications, but even without any um, physical changes, you can still have the metabolic changes. So really taking a history of what somebody was exposed to when they were diagnosed, even if currently their HIV is like the last of their issues. So for endothelial dysfunction, again, not totally understood whether this is due to chronic inflammation from HIV or whether the HIV virus itself is infecting and affecting the endothelial cells, but there's been a number of studies showing that there's endothelial dysfunction, decreased arterial mediated dilation, um, increased intima media thickness, decreased elasticity, more rapid rates of progression of atherosclerosis in people with HIV, um, even with well-controlled HIV. Um, that traditionally, Framingham risk score and other what we call traditional risk factors for cardiac disease correlate more with a small artery endothelial dysfunction, whereas HIV is associated both with small and large artery um, elasticity abnormalities. And importantly, antiretroviral therapy improves some of this endothelial dysfunction. There's a study that looked at arterial flow-mediated dilation, uh, which is a marker of endothelial dysfunction in people on treatment. Uh, the same people pre- and post-treatment had improvement in, the, in their endothelial function. So this study is a little bit busy, but basically the top is all comers, the bottom is HIV only looking at carotid artery ultrasound to see how well it predicts mortality in people with HIV as well as those without HIV. Uh, looking at plaque, common carotid artery, intima media thickness, and Young's modulus, which is basically a model of elasticity and, um, and endothelial function. So the dashed lines, so the red is a women cohort and blue is a male cohort, very unique, very <laughs> creative. Um, and the, the solid line is, um, is the most severe phenotype. The dotted line is the most mild phenotype or quartile, depending on the measurements. Everything else is in the middle. But basically, they show that there were differences by gender and HIV status. So for men, having baseline plaque caused a twofold increase in hazard of death. For women, that was not shown. For women, having the highest um, Young's modulus quartile, um, so basically the most arterial stiffness, uh, was associated with a 71% increased risk of death, uh, but did not sh was not shown for men. But what's very interesting was the common, com common carotid artery intima media thickness had a paradoxical relationship in people with HIV. So basically, you expect a thicker artery to indicate plaque and to be associated with mortality. And that was seen in the general population, but the opposite was actually seen in people with HIV. So the thicker the intima media, the thicker the intima media, the actually improved or decreased mortality in people with HIV. Now, not in this study, but in other another study, it showed that um, people with HIV who have low CD4, high viral load, and basically have uncontrolled HIV have the lowest common carotid artery intima media thickness. So 
what's probably happening is this complex phenomena of arterial remodeling, where it's a thinner artery doesn't necessarily indicate a healthier artery. This is seen in cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, other inflammatory conditions. Um, but for this reason, carotid ultrasound was less able to predict mortality in people with HIV compared to the general population. So looking at two cohort studies comparing uh, the rates of MI um, in NA Accord, that's the HIV cohort, compared to ARIC, which is the general population, show that there was an increased risk of MI or incidence of MI at all age groups, um, particularly 50 to 59 and above 60. What's important, though, is that if you look at the very wide confidence interval for above 60, that's because we don't actually, I mean, this is going to be changing, but currently we don't have that many patients living beyond 60, so the numbers are very small and should be interpreted with caution. In addition, NA Accord, the HIV cohort, did not differentiate between type 1 and type 2 MIs. I'll get into that, but almost 50% of MIs and people with HIV can sometimes be attributed to type 2 or non-plaque rupture MI. So what is the cause of the cardiovascular risk in people with HIV? And really it's thought to be mostly a function of immune status. So if you look at the adjusted as a ratio for MIs um, for not stratified by CD4 or viral load in this cohort, you see that there's increased risk of MI in people with HIV. However, if you look at based on CD4 counts, it really only holds up for those with a CD4 less than 500. So people with a functioning with a CD4, recent CD4, 500 or higher, generally have the, high, the same rate of MI as the general population, at least in this cohort study. Um, Nadir CD4, interestingly, was in multivariable analysis, which was not shown here, was the only predictor of increased MI risk. And I mentioned it earlier in one of the cases I started with, but Nadir CD4 indicates that somebody has had, if, the, if it's low, that they've had unchecked viral replication and sort of a long time to have the metabolic consequences of the virus itself before treatment. So this is an older study. Um, it's the SMART study. It was from 2006, so 13 years ago now. Um, and they were looking at a trial of whether interrupting treatment in a retroviral therapy um, was more or less effective than sort of continuous therapy, trying to spare people's side effects. Now, we know now that from large randomized controlled trials, the START and Temprano trial, that we need to start people on medication right away or they're going to have worse outcomes. So what was interesting about this study, though, is if you look at the adverse events in the people who had treatment interruption, they had higher rates of cardiovascular events. And so whether it was the dip in CD4 or the more likely the increase in, in viral load and viral replication leading to increased acute inflammation on top of the chronic inflammation was putting people at risk for cardiovascular events. So all the more reason that when people are have treatment interruption, whether it's provider-induced, not anymore, or patient-induced more commonly, they are at higher cardiovascular risk. So this is an interesting study. Um, so looking at blood thrombogenicity in people with HIV, so there's pig aorta in that um, enamer <laughs> uh, chamber, which is developed here at Mount Sinai, and looking at different shear conditions, so low shear um, in terms of the velocity of blood mimics the conditions of a normal blood vessel, whereas high shear in, sort of mimics the conditions of a 50% stenotic blood vessel. And it was shown regardless of shear conditions that there's increased thrombogenicity or sort of platelet aggregation on the aorta in people with HIV compared to uh, people without HIV. Now, for the high shear condition, so the stenotic blood vessel model, there was even more pronounced platelet aggregation or thrombogenicity in women, so potentially a hormonal effect, but not entirely understood. And to talk a bit about the gut, which is another interest of mine. Um, so early on in HIV infection, there's pretty rapid CD4 depletion in the intestinal compartment. Uh, this happens really within weeks um, or days even of acute HIV, and even when you achieve peripheral immune reconstitution, you have less robust immune reconstitution in the gut. 
This leads to an, an impaired GI barrier, microbial translocation, and is thought to be one of the major drivers of chronic inflammation in HIV. So the study in Nature looked, the top is humans and the bottom is um, rhesus macaques. But basically, if you look at different stages of HIV and then plasma lipopolysaccharides, so a component of gram-negative bacteria, um, that early on in infection compared to later on with chronic HIV or progressing to AIDS, the more immune dysfunction you have, the higher your levels of plasma lipopolysaccharide, indicating that you have more impaired intestinal barrier and you're translocating bacteria. Um, this was also seen in the, in the rhesus macaque model before and after infection with SIV, even as early as 10 weeks after, they showed increases in plasma lipopolysaccharide. Now this is important because if you look at levels of, poly, of plasma lipopolysaccharide, it, the higher the plasma levels are, it stimulates markers of inflammation. So intuitive but important to obviously see the data as well. So increased levels of interferon, um, activated CD8 cells, and importantly that once antiretroviral therapy is started, it doesn't go back to normal, but the, the level of plasma lipopolysaccharide and inflammation decreases. So to talk a bit about behavioral factors, so this study basically uh, looks at the prevalence of current smoking in people with HIV compared to the general population. And if you just look at the total, the top, um, that the prevalence of smoking, at least in 2009, was close to 40% for people with HIV, and in the general population, about half that, at 20%. There's a more recent study that I um, did not include but show that basically each group had about a three-point decrease in the prevalence, but the, the disparity and in the increased prevalence in people with HIV remains. And it, that goes down for every age group, gender, race, ethnicity, by socioeconomic status as well. So a lot of smoking. Um, I think, I feel like almost all my patients smoke, not, not just 40%. Um, in terms of other behavioral uh, risk factors, so I talked a little bit about stimulant abuse. Um, this study was published in JAMA Cardiology, looking at the type of MI. So type 1 is what we typically consider atherosclerotic risk contributing to. So plaque rupture, platelet plug, that's sort of the typical MI. A type 2 is, we call it different things, but type 2, supply demand, demand, is, uh, demand ischemia, spasm, but it's sort of this catch-all, anything that's not plaque rupture leading to an MI. And it was found that 50% of the MIs in people with HIV were actually type 2 MIs, not type 1. It's important, obviously, because you're going to target your risk factor modification, your secondary prevention, differently. Somebody isn't going to necessarily benefit from aspirin or statin if they had a type 2 MI compared to a type 1 MI. And so it's important to know the etiology. Um, in terms of causes of type 2 MI, most common was sepsis or bacteremia, but number two was cocaine or other uh, listed usually stimulant drug use. So this is a busy but also I like it slide, um, and it's titled Inflammaging. So basically atherosclerosis is one example of inflammaging, but what we see is with this chronic infection, particularly in patients who've had HIV for decades and were exposed to older medications, that there is this in sort of body milieu of chronic inflammation that then leads to multiple end organ manifestations. Atherosclerosis is one of those, but is not the only one. So increased rates of dementia, insulin resistance, which is related to the cardiac risk, anorexia, osteoporosis and bone disease is a big one, sarcopenia or decreased muscle mass, along with the bone disease are major contributors to frailty, which is a big issue in the aging HIV population, uh, pulmonary disease, cerebrovascular disease, but basically, that atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is sort of one component of this. So to go back to this slide, um, I've talked a bit about the um, behavioral risk factors, the leaky gut, um, the um, metabolic syndrome, but now to talk a little bit more specifically about antiretroviral therapy and the contribution. So I talked how, a, a bit about how antiretroviral therapy can contribute to insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, 
um, and lipid abnormalities. So specific agents, the back of ear um, carries a black box warning for possible increased risk of myocardial infarction. Um, this was seen really in one large cohort study and really had, didn't, was not replicated in randomized controlled trials. Traditionally, people were put on a back of ear because they had kidney disease and couldn't be put on tenofovir. So all the studies sort of and that major cohort study looking at a back of ear were affected by this channeling bias. People with chronic kidney disease sort of a priori have an elevated risk of cardiac disease. And so it's really hard to tease out what's the back of ear versus the fact that they had kidney disease and were put on a back of ear. Since 2014, there's been a fixed dose combination of a back of ear, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. And so people without kidney disease are being put on a back of ear since there's this fixed dose combination single pill. We haven't actually seen in the past four plus years any elevated um, rates of MI. So do with that what you will, but most of us are, feel very comfortable using a back of ear. Protease inhibitors I talked about can lead to dyslipidemia and insulin resistance. It's important to know that protease inhibitors aren't a class effect. So again, we're moving away from protease inhibitors due to drug-drug interactions and toxicity. But um, for example, atazanavir is shown to be potentially cardioprotective or cardiac neutral. We wouldn't be choosing atazanavir for this effect, but it's interesting kind of pathophysiology. So indirect bilirubin is an endogenous antioxidant. In the general population, higher rates of, in, of indirect bilirubin or total bilirubin correlate with lower events of coronary disease. And um, in a number of cohort studies, people put on atazanavir, which causes an indirect hyperbilirubinemia, had lower MI rates than people on other older antiretroviral um, agents or other protease inhibitors. So talking about treatment options along the treatment cascade, so primary prevention and then secondary prevention to prevent mortality. So the most data we have are on lipid-lowering agents, particularly statins, but there's also some smaller studies on targeting platelets. So calculating risk. So um, interestingly and, and thankfully, the two most recent updates of guidelines, the NLA in 2015 and the 2018 revision of ACC AHA, actually do directly mention HIV, which is new compared to older guidelines. Um, the guideline, the evidence that this is based on, though, is expert opinion. It's not necessarily based on randomized controlled trials. So it's possible, I mean, we know that there is elevated cardiac risk, but like I explained, the landscape is somewhat changing, and so it's unclear whether the kind of modern era of, of HIV, these patients have the same cardiac risk. But like I said, in both guidelines, in the NLA, um, guideline, HIV is considered, is considered an independent risk factor for HIV when you're tallying risk factors to determine statin treatment. And in the ACC, AHA is considered a risk enhancer uh, for people with moderate or sort of borderline cardiac risk. But in both conditions, sort of pushing you more likely to treat all other things being equal. So in terms of primary prevention, we do know that people with HIV at the very least have the same risk of cardiac disease as the general population. So it's good to, as a good first step, apply the general population guidelines, um, knowing that there's this unknown question of whether we need to be more aggressive or should be more aggressive, but there's not really data to support that per se at this time. Uh, smoking cessation, there's some evidence that there's disparities in smoking cessation. People with HIV are less likely to be assessed for readiness uh, to quit or the five A's that you're supposed to use when assessing somebody's readiness to quit something. Um, and so just keeping that in mind that I've had some success uh, with my patients just obviously being persistent, but it's a big problem. Um, controlling HIV and managing the comorbidities aggressively. So statins. So traditionally, there's been some fear or kind of anxiety, I guess, about using statins in people with HIV. Uh, there's potentially drug-drug interactions, um, somewhat elevated risk of myopathy uh, just from having another chronic condition. There is more common baseline CPK elevation, usually asymptomatic in people with HIV. That being said, um, you can absolutely find a safe and effective statin for your patient with HIV, no matter what their regimen is. 
So ritonavir and cobacistat, more commonly now we're seeing cobacistat, um, act through the P450 system as inhibitors or boosters, and they interact with most statins. That being said, there's a, a statin that's less commonly used, um, patavastatin, that's being examined in the reprieve trial, which I'll talk about a bit more, that really has no drug interactions with antiretroviral therapy. This is a moderate intensity statin, so your patient coming in with an acute STEMI, you'd probably still want to put them on something like a torvastatin. And our general rule of thumb is to sort of start low, go slow with the other higher intensity statins if they're on a booster. That being said, it's important to know that having HIV, no matter what your regimen, should not preclude you using statin therapy. Um, the primary care guidelines in 2014 and the European AIDS Clinical Society have more detailed information or very good resources when you're picking sort of which drugs based on your patient's regimen. So this is table eight. I'm not going to go from the primary care guidelines. I'm not going to go through all of it, but really gives you the evidence for how much uh, various drug exposure is increased based on drug-drug interactions with HIV um, medicine. And so you really can come up with a good uh, regimen for your patient who needs their lipids treated. So are we using statins? And the answer is not really as much as we should. So I did a retrospective chart review looking at our own uh, Jack Martin clinic, looking at people with HIV retained in care um, who met unequivocal guidelines to be on a statin. So I didn't look at the controversial groups because I thought that would be more confusing, um, but looked at these very clear groups, diabetics with LDL above 70, known ASCVD diagnosis, so secondary prevention, and severe hyperlipidemia of LDL of at least 190. And sort of looking at these different groups, about half in each high-risk group were on a statin. Doing further chart review, an additional half really had no indication documented as to why they shouldn't be on a statin. So it's often being missed. So this led to an educational intervention for doing the repeat data analysis. Um, but sort of how does this compare nationally? And we're actually doing a little bit better than some other people, but we're still, there's room for improvement. Um, but they're really, this lar larger study, I just looked at our clinic, but this larger study looked at uh, disparities in guideline application. So looking at the NAMCs and NHAMCS data from 2006 to 2014, people who met clear guideline um, indication to be on antiplatelet or, or antilipid therapy, you could see that the rates for the general population were pretty low, but they were much lower for people with HIV. So less likely to be on an antiplatelet or statin agent, even with clear guideline indications. So, it could be potentially hypothesized, like our statin's gonna even work in people with HIV. They have higher levels of inflammation. Is it gonna be effective? And the thing is they work as well as they do in people without HIV. So this intrepid study looked at patavastatin and pravastatin, and essentially the lipid lowering effects in people with HIV were essentially as predicted on the drug label. So these medications do work. Despite the elevated levels of inflammation, um, the medications are effective. So there's other data, the ACTG5087 showing, again, that, that statins work, and then Saturn HIV, I, I like because it shows a sort of subclinical endpoint, but basically that resuvastatin versus placebo does work, but also that the resuvastatin arm um, had cessation of progression of carotid enema media thickness in the statin arm compared to pro continued progression of the atherosclerosis in the placebo arm. So the question, though, that we're trying to answer, and there's an ongoing randomized controlled trial looking at this, but do they work for primary prevention among people without dyslipidemia? So Jupiter study, which probably many of you or all of you know, was not in HIV patients, but looked at people who didn't really have severe dyslipidemia, LDL less than 130, but did have elevated um, HSCRP, so did have um, evidence of inflammation, and they did benefit. There was a mortality benefit from suvastatin. So sort of extrapolating this to an HIV population, even in the absence of dyslipidemia, we know there's chronic inflammation. We know CRP levels are higher. It's part of the reason it's less helpful to check CRP in people with HIV. Um, but with that in mind, can using a statin actually help decrease cardiac risk or cardiac events? So that's sort of the concept behind the reprieve study, looking at patavastatin versus placebo um, and hard cardiac endpoints. 
So the design of the child, so it's a large multi-center child looking at people whose risk score is less than 15%, over 8,000 patients over eight years. It was recently extended. Um, and looking, like I said, at pitavastatin versus placebo and cardiac events as well as death. There's also a smaller mechanistic study looking at um, coronary calcium scores and sort of understanding how the statin's working. So aside from statins, so the new 2018 ACCHA guidelines mention the azetamib and then PCSK9 inhibitors for high-risk patients not able to achieve their LDL goals. And really, the short answer is there's very little data about PCSK9 inhibitors in HIV. But it's compelling because PCSK9 levels are higher, about 65% higher in people with HIV compared to those without. It does correlate with endothelial dysfunction. Um, and, it, yeah, and it's not really changed based on antiretroviral therapy, but is predicted by a detectable viral load and low CD4. So a quick note on anticoagulation, just because sort of it does fit into the cardiac, uh, the cardiac talk a little bit, and I feel like it comes up every time I'm on silver. But um, I mentioned a little bit that there's hypercoagulability, increased platelet aggregation in people with the HIV. Uh, there's also elevated rates of DVT, about two to 10 times, depending on what study you're looking at. So somebody with an unprovoked DVT, if they've never had an HIV test, even without an unprovoked DVT, they should be HIV tested. We should be testing everyone, but particularly you should be thinking about that extra if they have an unprovoked DVT. Uh, that being said, there are interactions with copacistat and ritonavir and NEP450 inhibitors and the DOAX or NOAX that we most commonly use for anticoagulation. Um, so there's data that of the DOAX and NOAX, uh, dabigatran actually has is not as much metabolized by the CYP enzymes, is more renally excreted, so ends up being often safer for people on a pharmacologic booster with HIV. And I just put that in because I feel like literally every time I'm on silver, this comes up, and it's helpful to refresh. So targeting other things. There's some very limited data maybe about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system being hyperactive in people with HIV mTOR inhibitors, there's some transplant data, uh, HIV kidney transplant patients that uh, sirolimus can not only decrease HIV reservoir but decrease vascular proliferation. But um, these are all very, very small studies and need to be validated and looked into further. Um, there is data looking at platelets. I showed you that there is increased platelet aggregation. Fortunately, aspirin, while showing promise at one in 12 weeks, did not really pan out at 24. There's maybe this question of whether non-COX inhibition of platelets with clopidogrel works better, but again, needs to be uh, validated. So back to our cases. So case one, so 65-year-old guy diagnosed in the 80s, older ARV exposure, probably based on his low nadir CD4 count, unchecked viral replication, and exposure to older meds, the HIV plus the therapy and sort of the whole picture really are contributing to his cardiac risk. In contrast, the patient, the second patient, which are people being diagnosed now, this sort of modern HIV epidemic, really the HIV likely plays negligible risk, um, uh, has negligible risk contribution to his coronary risk. And understanding sort of where your patient falls, like I said, is important. So just some take home points. So, all comers with HIV, because we see people newly diagnosed as well as diagnosed a while ago, there is excess CBD risk about 1.5 times in terms of the rates of MI. Um, there are people aging with HIV diagnosed decades before versus newly diagnosed have different levels of risk, and how to manage their comorbidities is going to be tailored um, accordingly. The largest modifiable risk factor is smoking, and people with HIV are less likely to be screened for readiness to quit. Um, I talked a bit about the multifactorial etiology. It's important to both treat HIV, but really, now that we're not worried about people dying from the HIV, we need to more aggressively and very aggressively manage and assess for comorbidities. Um, we need better tools for cardiovascular disease risk assessment. At least in our clinic population, diabetics with LDL above 70 were an often overlooked population that should automatically be on a statin. You shouldn't even be applying the ASCVD risk calculator there. Um, 
There, you can always find a statin for your patient, regardless of their regimen. Um, but patavastatin, if you remember that one, has no ARV interactions. And there are some remaining gap, gaps in the data, but stay tuned. That's it. Any questions? Uh, thanks for a terrific lecture. Uh, I'm struck by the um, age aspect of this HIV, and I guess uh, in my terminology I would say it, HIV virus is an accelerator of normal cellular aging. And if I'm right, or if your presentation led me to that, are there folks in your field who are looking at cellular aging? I don't mean aging of the total human being, but mm -hmm. Cellular aging accelerated by the HIV virus. Is there somebody studying that that you know of? I'm not a name that comes to mind, but there there's a comorbidity conference each year that I've gone to that specifically talks about some of the aging effects. It ends up, I can get back to you um, with particular studies, but yes, there are people looking at specific cellular aging, but it ends up more being the, the comorbidities and accumulation of comorbidities. You mentioned that HIV induces a macrophage laden with lipids. Is there any data on the effect on the immune system of that, given the role of macrophages mm -hmm. in, in immunity and inflammation? Is, there, um, is it a druggable target? Is it a... Uh... No, that's a great question. Um, yeah, no, there are people looking at dendritic cells and macrophages, and um, I can't speak specifically to their research, but yes, that looking at the specific cellular inflammation effects of that, of that phenomenon. And follow-up question on that, does it decrease or increase circulating LDLs, the, the, the fact that there are more lipids within the macrophage? So untreated HIV is going to actually lead to decrease of all cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, um, and then you do see the elevated in triglycerides, so probably Hi, uh, Robert Rosenson. Um, very nice lecture. We uh, presented that at the American Heart Association meeting from uh, Market Scan. Uh, about 88,000 HIV patients, four to one matching. We had uh, data on risk factors, lipids, cigarette smoking. And what we showed is that the multivariate adjusted risk for MI was increased to 1.38. We couldn't distinguish between primary and secondary, but there was a higher risk of stroke at 1.5 and a doubling the rates of lower extremity arterial disease hospitalizations. So, you know, you know, we're revising the discussion uh, on the manuscript, but I think that Kaiser is an outlier. I think that there's more comprehensive system-based, uh, you know, approaches, higher use of stands. But even in our subgroup where we adjusted for stands, the risk remained, uh, you know, higher in those uh, individuals. So. I think it's still an important risk factor, and I think research into some of these other areas, like the chronic, uh, you know, inflammation, immunoregulation, I think is another uh, dimension that needs to be uh, explored uh, more. With regards to LDL cholesterol lowering, we reported from the Scenix group, uh, Rear Burkholder, the first author, uh, that there was a lesser LDL cholesterol, uh, you know, reduction, and this may be due to the NNRTs. Um, you know, in terms of the lower statin levels, I agree that patavastatin is uh, different, but in the Scenix cohort, very few people were on uh, uh, patavastatin. And the last thing, we're the global leader in the Bajernic study with PCSK9, completely enrolled study, and in about uh, you know, maybe eight months, we'll have those results, uh, you know, presented. Awesome. No, great point. Thank you. Yeah, um, very interesting um, data on the, the elite controllers. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any um, indication as to whether treatment of those had a difference on their outcome. No, it's a great point. So I, there was a small number, so it was about 150. So obviously, you have to take a sample size with a grain of salt. Um, but that being said, yeah, we've had many sort of discussions about like what is the kind of intersection genetically, like could it be a CCR2 or kind of what, what is the mechanism there. Um, but I, not just this study, but any, I kind of use this as well as other things that like with comorbidities and polypathology to 
try and convince some of my patients with a leak, even with a leak control, I don't have that many of like two, um, that they should potentially be on antiretroviral therapy, that there is an effect of having an untreated infection, even if you're not detecting plasma circulation of virus. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you.